A good friend contacted me to let me know that he had a couple of lawnmowers that I could take home with me the next time I visited. About a week later, I made the two-hour drive to pick them up, and I was quite surprised by the mowers he had for me. The one that caught my eye was this red Craftsman, and the reason is, red is one of the hardest colors to keep from fading in the sunlight. I had a good feeling about this one, and hopefully by the end of this video, I'll prove that I was right about it. Today's project is this Craftsman lawnmower with a very reliable Briggs flathead engine, and if you saw the shorts video, you'll know what the problem is, it doesn't run. It only starts and runs for a few seconds if you physically put fuel into the carp's throat. That means we do have enough compression from the engine to run and a working ignition system that just leaves the fuel system as the most likely issue. Now, I'm going to try and repair this mower, however, it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. Now, we're only going to mention what these other options could be. We don't have enough time to look into them, but if you need more information on these options, you're welcome to ask as many questions as you need to. After looking over this mower, it's in surprisingly good condition, which is pretty incredible in my opinion. By the way it looks and how the cables work, this must have been stored inside most of its life. Now there is still some fuel in the tank and it smells like fresh gasoline from the pump, so I'm pretty certain it was recently put into the tank. After taking out the dipstick, it looks like there's too much oil in the engine, but remember, to get an accurate reading, we need to wipe it clean first and then reinstall it back into the engine. Of course, make sure the mower is also on level ground as well. So that's not a good sign. It looks like the oil level is below the low mark, so that makes me wonder if the engine has been damaged because it was ran with low oil for a very long time. We won't know until we get it running again, but before I tear into the carb, I want to give this mower a quick cleaning. Now there are two good reasons why I want to clean this mower before trying to repair it. The first reason is that oil, dirt, and even dried grass clippings can hide problems like leaks and even cracks. The grass can hold moisture which will then allow rust to form. And it looks like we got a lot of grass under the cover for the self propel belt. I'll just get rid of this and then we'll start cleaning the mower. The grass could get lodged between the transmission and the deck and could cause some serious issues like causing the drive to never completely turn off. The other reason is that constant friction between the dried grass and the spinning pulley could start a grass fire. The other good reason to clean this mower is to prevent dirt from getting into places that could hurt the engine, specifically the carb. I know I mention the gas tank frequently, but there's a built-in screen inside the tank to deal with large debris. Yet another good reason is to keep my hands as clean as possible while I work on the mower to reduce the chances of cross-contamination. Now I try my best to keep my hands clean, but I still can't be prevented, only kept to a minimum. Now, if you look at my old videos from several years ago, I used to not clean anything, and that was on purpose. The main reason was time. I simply didn't have the time I needed to diagnose and repair a piece of equipment, and on top of that, clean it. My repairs from years ago used to take less than one hour, including filming. However, now I find my repairs are getting to the point that my camera is running out of power. That means it's been on for almost four hours. Now, I don't mind it too much because I think it helps me present the concept of each video better, but part of that time also includes some sort of cleaning either on camera or off camera. To be honest, it really doesn't matter in most cases how clean stuff is, but I do want to be consistent as possible when it comes to video presentation. I typically start the cleaning process on these mowers by pre-treating the stubborn areas and then I start on the top of the engine, working my way down to the mowing deck and finally to the wheels. I use a variety of cleaners from a citrus based cleaner to a liquid soap and even an engine degreaser. I do have a bottle of purple power but I keep forgetting to bring it out to my work area. I used to use my pressure washer and I have to admit that it's much faster to use but I find it difficult to use on something like a small engine and a mowing deck. There are simply too many nooks and tight spots for the water to get at successfully without engulfing the engine in water. I do like using it when I want to clear the dry grass under the mowing deck but to be honest it's the same issue there. It's just too much water and because of the shape of the deck the only thing that gets covered in water is typically me. Speaking of the mowing deck, I was quite surprised at how clean it was underneath here. It's strange because it's very uniformly clean. I don't see any signs of scraping or pressure washing. My only guess is that whoever had it before must have religiously used the wash port to clean the deck after each and every use. I've never tried it, but I guess these things really work so long as you use them on a regular basis. 
so I only have the rear door to clean along with the wheels. I don't want to spoil future videos, but I recently sold several items in a single day, and I think the reason why was that all the pieces looked clean, which in my book makes them look more like they're new. I know that when I buy something, the only thing I need to know is that it works like it should. The way it looks is secondary. However, I also don't want it to look like it's been left outside in the mud and rained on. So faded paint, scuffs on plastic parts, and missing paint due to wear and tear are just battle scars and it shows that it can take a beating and keep on working. But what if it's covered in grass clippings, leaves, and mud? It basically shows the person who had it didn't care enough to clean it, and if they didn't bother cleaning it, what else did they neglect to do for it? Now you can wash away mud, dirt, and oil off a machine, but you can't wash away years of neglect and abuse. However, you can at least make it look a little nicer and more presentable. In my situation, I think the machines look nicer on camera when they're clean, but for someone else it may not be that important. The last thing we need to do is get the belt cover back on and then we'll fix this mower. The first thing I want to do is to drain the fuel out of the tank and confirm that it's not stale or worse yet have any water in it. There are several different ways to drain it, but I'm going to use a siphon. Another way would be to remove the fuel line from the tank and drain it there. Now I didn't get as much as I wanted and that's because of the way the tank is shaped, but what I did get looks and smells fresh. I need to get to the fuel that's at the lowest point in the tank because that's where the water would be at. So I'm going to drain the tank at the fuel line instead. Now to prevent the fuel from leaking everywhere when taking off the fuel line, I have the mower tilted towards the sky. Once I get the line on the fuel port, I then put the mower back into a horizontal position, and most of the fuel should come out of the tank. To get all the fuel out of the tank, I should have pressurized the tank, but I didn't think about it at the time, so whatever might be left is still going to spill on the mowing deck. The next thing I'm going to do is to remove the bowl nut, which on this type of carb is also the fuel jet as well. After getting it out, I'm going to check that the openings on the side of it are clear. Now these openings rarely clog because of their size, but what does clog is the opening on the top, which is very small in comparison. To clear the opening, I'm going to use a small wire, but carb cleaner should work as well. Now, I wasn't planning on taking off the car, but instead I was planning on clearing the jet and then reinstalling it, and then putting some fuel into the tank and then try starting it, but something was telling me to take off the carb for a full inspection. Now, it's not hard to do on this engine, but there are a few things you need to watch out for. One thing I need to get here is more tools because the clearance here is just a little too tight, so a quarter inch drive socket would fit better here than a 3 8 The other thing to watch for is the auto choke air vein on top of the carb. If you remove it wrong, the vein could get into position that doesn't allow it to work anymore and you'll have to pull the top cover off to reposition it. So everything looks okay on this carb, but I see a really bad sign. What I see is this discoloration at this opening, which tells me that this carb was leaking fuel. That typically means there's an issue with the needle, float, or the seat that the needle seals against. To get a better look, we need to look at the float. Now the carb bowl itself is pretty clean, so the issue is definitely not related to the fuel past or present. So if I move the float, it's moving like it should, and it's also moving the needle, so I know it's not stuck in the open position. The next thing I want to do is to flip the carb over and check the float's closed position. If you lift the float and let it fall back into a resting position, you can see that it's not parallel with the bowl's seat. I'll use my screwdriver to show you the angle that it's at. Now, it might be hard to see, so I'll overlay both images to show you that they are not parallel. The reason this is important is because it tells me there's an issue with the seat, and more than likely it's swollen and not letting the needle seal to it like it's supposed to. That's the reason why the carb was leaking fuel and why that opening was discolored by old gasoline. The next thing I want to do is to remove the pin, the float, and the needle so we can take a better look at the seat. After removing the assembly, you can see the red seat at the bottom of its opening. I'll adjust the brightness and contrast so you can see it better. What I see is an opening that's about 25% smaller than it's supposed to be. Now that doesn't sound like a serious issue, but it can cause the float to not work like it should and cause the carb to leak fuel, which is something you don't want. So to fix this issue, I would normally replace the seat with a new one, but I hate to say it, the chances of a successful repair is not very good. So to increase my chances, I'm going to use the model and serial number to find the correct carb and simply replace it. The reason is, I don't want to waste my time with a repair that only has a 30-50% to 50 chance of success, when I can just buy a $15 carb and increase my percentage to about 95%. 
So here's the new carb, and before I install it, I'm going to look it over and make sure it looks like the original one. Now this may seem like a trivial task, but people make mistakes, so this is a good way to keep from installing the wrong part. After looking at it from all sides, I'm certain it's going to work, so I'm going to install it now. So how did I come up with this 30 to 50% chance of fixing it? Well, it's from personal experience. In fact, I think some of the failures have been documented on this or my other channel, and in the end, I replaced the carb. Now, once the air vein has been installed on the carb, check to make sure that it moves freely. If it doesn't, you'll need to remove the top cover and the recoil assembly to find out why. I understand if you don't want to replace the carb and would rather pay for the needle and seat repair kit, but it's only about half the price of a new carb, so why not pay a couple of bucks more to increase your chances of a successful repair? Now, I don't intend on putting any fuel into the tank when I get this repair done. Instead, I'm going to put fuel into the line, which will only put fuel into the bowl of the carb. The reason is that I have another video I'm going to film right after this one's done, and I don't want any fuel in the tank. It'll make more sense when you see that video. When installing the air filter base, remember to connect the emissions breather hose to this port on the back of the carb, otherwise the engine will breathe in unfiltered air which could cause premature wear to the piston rings. If the rings wear too fast, the engine will have less compression and of course that means less power. So I'm installing the same air filter as before, I just tapped most of the loose debris out of it. The last thing I want to mention is that I accidentally poured a small amount of used oil into my fresh oil jug, thinking it was the other one. I'm not going to get rid of it because it has some used oil in it, that's why my oil has a bit of color to it. So luckily it starts and runs, which is great news. The only issue is that the running speed is a bit slow for my taste, so I'm going to increase it just a tiny amount. The engine speed is controlled by this spring, and to increase the speed, we need to increase the tension on the spring. To do that, I'm going to bend the anchor the spring is attached to while the engine is running. That way, I won't over-rev the engine. Like I said, I was only going to increase the speed by a very small amount. Now increasing the speed without using a tack is very dangerous because if you increase it too much, the engine could break. So I wouldn't increase your engine speed unless you know what you're doing and the risks involved. Another option as to why the engine wouldn't start is that the ignition timing is off from where it's supposed to be because the blade has made contact with something like a stump or a large rock. First confirm that there is a gouge on the edge of the blade, and if there is, then replace the key on the flywheel and the ignition timing should return to normal. So my question is, how often do you check your oil in your mower? Once or twice a year, or possibly once a decade? Now if the previous owner had taken better care of this mower, they probably still have it and not given it away. Thank you for watching, I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions about this project or your own projects, and I hope to see you in the next video.